Today's headline is Scout and Spy. Everyone works at constant risk of life. The subheadline says, Adventures of a Spy Who Worked Under Sheridan's Command, A Desperate Struggle for Life Close by a Hostile Campfire. This article originally came from the New York Sun. It says, The difference between a scout and a spy in war times is little more than technical. A spy is in citizen's dress, the enemy's uniform, female apparel, any disguise he may select, and he penetrates the enemy's lines. A scout is supposed to wear the uniform of his army and to work between the lines. However, both spy and scout are sent out after information and are expected to obtain it at any personal risk. If the scout can't get it with his uniform on or on neutral ground, he must assume some disguise and get within the enemy's lines. It is certain death to the spy when caught. A scout may have one chance in 50 of pulling through. If caught on the eve of a battle, a drumhead court-martial will make short work of him. During the last three years of the late war, I was constantly engaged in spying and scouting, being attached to several well-known commanders, and some of the adventures I had may be considered worth reading. Thousands of scout and spy stories have been printed since the war, and of the hundreds which have fallen under my eye, not one of them appeared to have been written or dictated by a genuine scout. The common idea is that a scout leaves the lines at dark, appears before the enemy's defenses an hour later, counts the cannon, estimates the troops, glances at the strength of the position, and is back before midnight to report to his general that all is lovely and it requires only a prompt advance to wipe out the opposing force. After the conference of Grant and Sheridan in the latter's camp before Winchester, which resulted in the famous order to go in, I was called to Sheridan's headquarters. Maps of the front of both armies were shown me. It was a strange country to me, and the map of the rebel front could not be depended on as accurate. I want you, said the general, to scout from one wing of Early's army to the other between his pickets and his camps. I want the length of his lines and the lay of the ground. Take particular notice of streams, highways, hills, and natural defenses. I shall expect you back in three days. I had a nearly new blue uniform, $50 in gold, and a couple of revolvers. Also Sheridan's pass to come and go at pleasure. It was about 9 o'clock in the morning when I received my instructions, and 20 minutes later, I was riding to the left of our lines. Our left was at Berryville, confronting Early's right. Our right at Bunker Hill, in front of Winchester, confronting his left. I was going in on Early's right flank and to move down his lines. The Opequin Creek, a respectably sized stream, lay between the two armies, and the lines ran through forests and thickets and over hills and cleared farms. As nearly as could be known, Early had the larger force, and it was thought that Sheridan would do well to hold his own against him, saying nothing of assuming the offensive. I rode to the last picket post on our left before dismounting. The lines here were half a mile apart, running through thicket and wood, and the rebel picket was about pistol shot away. There was no picket firing, and in the course of half an hour, I was beyond the picket and ready to turn to the right. There was real danger now. I could hear the hum and bustle of the camps on my left, not much over a quarter of a mile away, and I felt that I must make my way down this strip, not over half a mile wide, for five or six miles, exposed every moment to discovery. The first mile was under cover, but I advanced from tree to tree as cautiously as an Indian fighter creeping upon his victim. It was well that I took these precautions. I had reached the end of the woods and had a field about 40 rods wide to cross when I suddenly heard the report of a light rifle only a few yards away. I was then creeping on my hands and knees, and as the report came, a man in rebel uniform stepped out from behind a large tree and picked up a squirrel which he had shot. He had evidently been in ambush for some time, and had I been advancing carelessly, he would certainly have discovered me. He had several other squirrels, and after two or three minutes, he flung them over his shoulder and started for camp. I waited for him to get well away, and then crossed the open space by creeping along a fence, which was nearly covered by bushes. Then there was another stretch of woods, broken by several ravines, and I had reached the middle of it before I saw anyone. When not creeping on my hands and knees, I was advancing in a stooping position, keeping the lay of the ground in my mind and directly, I came to a spring in a ravine at which a rebel was filling a string of canteens. I was on a ridge and was almost over the man before I discovered him. He was so occupied with his work that my movements had not attracted his attention, and I flanked him and passed on. Forty rods away, 
I had to hide in a fallen treetop to let the picket relief pass me, and in making the next half mile, I encountered more than a dozen persons. Some were after wood, others going to springs, and two sat on a log playing at cards, with a considerable heap of money between them. I had gone down the front for two miles by mid-afternoon, and could remember the lay of every acre of ground. Then as I skirted the creek, I had to climb over a fallen tree, and as I dropped lightly on the other side, a hand seized my right ankle, and a thick voice growled out, Sure, you've come for me, eh? Want to take me back, do you? Well, you can do it. A strapping big fellow lay beside the log. He had been drinking too much, but that he was not helplessly drunk, I soon had reason to know. As near as I could gather from his disjointed sentences, he had had trouble with a sergeant in his company and came out to hide himself. In spite of my blue uniform, he took me for the sergeant, and thinking I had followed him from camp, he was ugly-minded. He not only refused to let go of my ankle, but meant fight, and in another minute we were hard at it. In those days, I was something of an athlete and fighter, but this was the strongest and most obstinate fellow I had ever encountered. All his efforts were aimed at getting a clutch on my throat, and I had nearly to kill him to get loose. There was danger that someone might appear at any moment, and it was with a thankful heart that I got away from the locality. I soon found, however, that the woods beyond me were full of soldiers, some gathering fuel, others digging roots, or gathering bark, and three or four were after squirrels. I got into the top of a fallen tree, pulled the brush over and around me, and decided to wait for darkness before making another move. While laying here, a dog which belonged to one of the hunters came sniffing at my hiding place and presently set up a furious barking. His owner came sauntering up, pitched a couple of clubs at the brush, and then passed on, saying, Come away, Bob. The darn thing has gone to the hole in there. Nothing else occurred to alarm me during daylight, and as soon as twilight came, I resumed progress. I moved rapidly now, having no fear of encountering anyone except when crossing a road or at one of the fords. I reached Early's extreme left by 10 o'clock, and was no sooner there than I detected the movement of troops. My first thought was that they were moving up against the Union right, but a closer investigation proved that they were being marched to the rear. This was on the night of September 17th. A large force from this wing was detached that night and next morning to make a heavy reconnaissance in the direction of Martinsburg. I could not tell where they were going, but I got close enough to the camp pickets to learn from their conversation that it was a move independent of Sheridan. Early's right was very weak, and the ground most favorable for a rapid offensive movement by Sheridan. His right, rising on the elevation known as Bunker Hill, fronted by the woods and backed by the town, had been looked upon as impregnable. He was now weakening it by sending off troops, and as I moved here and there along the front of the camp, I got a very close estimate of the number of troops being sent off. I lay for 20 minutes within 15 steps of a campfire, around which several officers were waiting, and I plainly heard one of them say, the old man early probably knows his gate, but if Sheridan is the man we've been told he was, there'll be fun here in a day or two. He referred to withdrawing the troops in the face of an impending battle, and his prophecy was to be fulfilled to the letter. I had to go out at Early's left, guarded by cavalry, and these troops must have received orders to keep an extra sharp lookout. I was creeping across the field in which the county fairgrounds were situated, trying to locate the rebel vedette when a man came running out of the darkness, plump at me. He came upon me so suddenly and stealthily that I could not dodge him, and as he plumped against me, we were tumbled in a heap. I had no doubt that he was a rebel who was seeking my capture, and in half a minute, I was on top and had him by the throat. He lost his courage at once and made little resistance. My first thought was to strangle him, but it suddenly occurred to me that he had neither musket nor saber, and I loosened my grip a little and whispered, Make the last outcry, and I will be the death of you. What are you following me for? I, I wasn't. Weren't you after me? No, I didn't see you until I fell over you. Do you know who I am? No. Where are you going? Who are you? He asked in a cautious way, after taking half a minute for reflection. I'm a yank. No, say, you be honest? Yes. And you didn't mean to stop me? No. Say, yank, let me up. I'm a rep, one of Rhodes men, and I was deserting to you. I don't believe it. It's gospel truth. I'll go right into the Yankee camp with you, and I'm sick and tired of this secession business. You needn't fear. I ain't got as much as a jackknife about me. Do you know what troops left the front a little while ago? I do, every single regiment of them, and I know they're going to Martinsburg to fight your General Averill.
And do you know where the Rebel Cavalry pickets are? I do, and I'll take you through as slick as shooting. Mush. But ain't I glad you ain't a rep. I'm as weak as a cat, overthinking I'd been nabbed while trying to desert. I felt satisfied that he was alright, but as a matter of precaution, carried a revolver in my hand and made him go ahead. He had been down to the cavalry picket on Early's left with a teamster the day before, and had no trouble in locating it now. We flanked it to the left, crept through the woods on hands and knees for a quarter of a mile, and presently, as my foot broke a stick, a voice challenged us. It was a union picket, and an hour later, we were ushered into Sheridan's tent. My man proved to be a bonanza. He was an intelligent, observing fellow, a native of the locality, and he knew the topography of the country to perfection. He had a pretty accurate knowledge of the strength of each arm of service in Early's army and could enumerate at least 15 regiments. He described all defenses, advised as to how the approach should be made, and proved a great prize to my commander. On the evening of the next day, Sheridan put his army in motion, and I afterwards saw that the man who had stumbled over me in the dark had furnished the plan of battle. Nearly all his suggestions were acted upon, and with the greatest success. Early was caught napping sure enough. His right went with a rush as Sheridan struck it, and when he called in everything to make his final stand in front of the town, the absence of the force sent to Martinsburg was severely felt. He made a stout fight a better one than would have been thought possible under the circumstances, but foot by foot, he was pressured back on the pike, through the graveyard, into and beyond the town, and then his troops broke, and it was every man for himself. Three or four days later, when Sheridan came up with him at Fisher's Hill, I went into the night with a cavalry regiment. As we charged Early's left, I captured a captain and got him and his horse safe to the rear. The first words he uttered were, didn't I say there'd be fun if your man Sheridan was the fighter folks say he was? He was the man whose voice I heard at the campfire on the night of the 17th. This story came from the great state of Massachusetts, being reported in the Boston Sunday Globe of April 13th, 1888. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below, and we'll see you next time on Americana Archives.